It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Nick Gravish. Nick is a postdoctoral fellow at the Wyss Institute at uh, Harvard yeah. University, and um, he got uh, formerly a PhD from Georgia Tech. He's a physicist by training, and he has been looking at uh, biology, especially insects, and the way in which they behave and interact with each other. He has been doing also a lot of work uh, with robots, and he's one of the few physicists I know who also know robots quite well and know how to use and build them. And um, uh, last year, when I was on sabbatical, the business at Harvard, I had uh, great discussions with Nick, and I learned a lot of things. So it's a big pleasure to have you here and uh, listen to some of your work. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Dr. Dario. Mm -hmm. Nice to chat with you guys this morning. I'll to chat with you, whoever I haven't chatted with later uh, today. So I'm a postdoc at Harvard. Um, I'm working in both the biology lab, uh, in which we study insect flight, and the robotics lab, in which we build small flying um, robotic-like insects. Um, and as with the title of my talk, Dynamic Locomotion in Complex Environments, I'll start with sort of what I think is a very um, good example of dynamic locomotion in complex environments. In nature, uh, animals are constantly confronted to move through environments that are spatiotemporally complex. They may um, be non-Newtonian in their sort of uh, animal environment interactions. The ground may flow underfoot. Um, and so locomotion is challenged in these environments because you're constantly challenged with uh, variable footholds, uh, variable different features that you have to avoid. And I think of a second set of, of sort of complexity in the environment that comes from being part of a collective. Um, as you saw from the title of my talk, uh, I work with social insects, and I think that in many cases, um, animals or humans are forced to move through crowded, complex environments in which the complexity doesn't come from um, you know, features of the environment, but rather features of the, the collective. And so there's largely two themes, uh, or, sorry, three themes that uh, emerge uh, in, in the work that I'm going to present. And the first one is that when looking at, at uh, biological systems moving in sort of complex, realistic natural environments, um, we see that there emerges this generic feature of multimodal, mo multimodal locomotor behaviors. Okay? So oftentimes animals um, use many different appendages or sensory systems for many different things than what you would think they were used for. Uh, feet become fins, antenna become limbs, things like that. I'll talk a little bit about that um, within this talk today. Second is this just very broad idea of robustness, that if you remove an animal's limb, oftentimes it runs very well, um, despite having five instead of six limbs. Um, and in this sort of com uh, collective sense, robustness can also mean that if you have an a group of 100 individuals and you remove 50 of them, they often still are capable of um, thriving and, and succeeding in living. And lastly, it's this um, idea, which I'm just sort of putting forward, which is um, innate control, which I'll, I'll describe uh, and leave a little nebulous now, but basically this idea that collectives can construct environments which embed some features of control within those environments. Uh, and so you can sort of pre-program stable collective locomotion within the environment itself by the mere feature that you alter the environment to, uh, to your super needs. And so increasingly in biology departments and, and physics departments as well, uh, we're starting to look at studying locomotion of these uh, uh, organisms in more realistic natural environments. So this is an example, three examples from the literature of uh, looking at how birds fly through cluttered aerial environments, looking at how cockroaches navigate very cluttered, um, complex terrestrial environments, and how fish even move through their, their three-dimensional structured environments. And studies like this all give us a better insight into the the multitude of sensory and, um, and uh, control strategies these animals employ when moving through these, these environments that are more than just um, a simple runway in which they're challenged to sprint at top speed. Um, it places what we observe, this sort of locomotion, um, the morphology of the animals, uh, in a more ecologically relevant context, so we can maybe understand um, something about morphology as it's related to the environments that these animals move through. Um, and lastly, it implicates the importance of environment organism interaction. So challenging animals to move through realistic environments where foot, the foot moves the sand under foot, and so there's an interaction there that is not necessarily captured by looking at locomotion across hard surfaces. That's important in, in sort of gaining some realistic insight into how, um, how these interactions affect locomotion. And when you start to look at these animals moving through more realistic complex environments, uh, again, sort of uh, as compared to sprinting at top speed down a, a single trackway, uh, what we see is that 
we start to need new tools to be able to quantify and capture all the different behaviors that we see these animals use to confront these environments, okay? And I think a very nice example of this came out this last year, this is hidden down here, but this is um, by Chen Li and Bob Fole, looking at the different behavioral strategies that cockroaches use to, um, to get around uh, grassy type objects. So there's many different ways in, this, in which these animals behave when confronted with these environments. Oftentimes they got through by rolling their body, but other times when you put a manipulation on them to, to, to disable rolling, they exhibit other behaviors. And so when you look at locomotion in more complex realistic environments, you see that there's not often one solution, but there's many solutions and that animals use many different types of behaviors. And so we need to be able to, to capture all these behaviors and understand and distill um, these different types of locomotor modes um, that, that we see in the natural world. So at some level, what, I, what I'm arguing is that we need um, the type of tools to do these experiments, to study these animals moving through realistic, uh, complex uh, natural environments. And we need to be able to quantify um, the behaviors that we observe, the differences in behaviors, and to be able to extract out some principles of locomotion in these environments. And so a lot of my work has been towards developing uh, tools uh, in doing biological experiments to understand and quantify um, the range of behaviors we see when animals are moving through the, the types of worlds that you, you observe them in, in nature. Um, some of these are using automated motion capture analysis tech tools to look at um, uh, gait patterns and high fidelity, uh, using multi-camera techniques to, to track and extract out wing beat patterns of flying insects, for inse instance. Um, more recently, with colleagues at Harvard, this should say with James Carl down here, who is actually the graduate student who's doing most of this work, um, looking at the collective behaviors of individuals in a group. Uh, and this work is very much inspired by work of Laura Keller, uh, in which we use barcode uh, tracking system to look at the, the collective behaviors of individuals. And as I'll talk about in a little bit, the individual locomotor behaviors, behaviors of those, um, those bumblebees within that group. And then lastly, like I said, um, like Dario said, I like to use and think about how we can use uh, robotic model systems to address hypotheses that are developed from looking and studying these biological systems, but also use the robotic model systems to, to generate hypotheses that we can then test with the animals themselves. Uh, and this is uh, related to some of the work that I do in the microrobotics lab. And so, I mean, I, I think I just put in a quick aside here that I. I think we're all familiar with how, how robotics um, has been inspired by biology. Bioinspired robotics is a, a large field in which we see lots of um, very interesting robots come out from, from collaborating and working with biologists, from looking at nature and looking at how animals move. And I think more recently, there is a, there's a flip side to that coin that a lot of um, biologists are now using robotics and developing uh, robots themselves to address hypotheses and to uh, answer biological questions. And so, I think it's a really exciting time right now to be looking at how this is all coming full circle and there's a, a great illustration of the kind of um, uh, crosstalk that occurs between biology and robotics. Uh, and there's a lot of science that can be done from, from this sort of crosstalk. All of my citations down here are not showing. So, um, so like I said, um, in my talk today I'm going to be giving basically two stories. Um, they are from the world of social insects. I did my PhD working with fire ants, and so I'll be talking a little bit about fire ants and the locomotor behaviors that we observe uh, in their natural environments, and then some more recent work with bumblebees and the types of behaviors that we see when they're confronted with challenging environments as well. So these are the two sort of uh, subtopics. I'll spend about two-thirds of the talk talking about how uh, ants confront the subterranean nests that they uh, construct and move through, and a little bit, about a third of the talk on aerial, uh, aerial locomotion. So why are social insects useful in this type of research? I think that there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from social insects. There's a lot of interesting, interesting uh, behaviors that they exhibit, and there's a lot of interesting biology as well. Um, I think if you're interested in particularly locomotion questions, how do animals um, maneuver through complex environments, being a simple question that we may ask, um, well, social insects present a very useful um, toolkit to address some of these questions. One. Many of them uh, are central place foragers, such that they often go back to their nest. They are living in a collective, foragers go out for food. If you would like to understand how um, an ant is affected by an inclined slope and how its gait may change, you can put an inclined slope between it and food and you can collect data on how it's moving. So, so central place, place foraging um, is a nice 
useful uh, uh, feature of these organisms that allows you to do the kind of experiments that I'm talking about. Second is you see a natural behavioral variation within social insects. Uh, so oftentimes, a morphologically identical worker will have a very different behavior than another worker, um, maybe based on age, as I'm showing here with honeybees, which sort of show this alloethism where they, they um, change their behavior based on uh, how old they are. Um, but you can see other different uh, behavioral variation among other social insects as well, uh, which may couple into the types of um, locomotor uh, programs that they may, be, they may be using when they're confronted with, with um, uh, environments that they have to move through. Um, another nice feature of working with social insects is there's a natural size variation. So this is uh, the fire ants here. These are all uh, fire ant workers, all uh, females, all basically isomorphically uh, the same, except that you have a around a three to four times uh, size variation. So, so addressing questions about how things like uh, body mass, muscle, cross-sectional area, uh, limb length affect locomotor parameters are very useful to be studied in, in social insects because you have a natural size variation that can be exploited to answer these questions. The same is true for bumblebees down here, uh, in which you again see uh, large scale size variation. And then the last of these two features are that you can observe social insects over long-term um, periods uh, by tagging them and watching them over time. And um, of course, they exhibit cool collective behaviors that we also are interested um, in biology as well. And so I'm going to start this talk off with uh, some work that I've been doing recently on studying the uh, locomotor behaviors of bees. Uh, in particular, if you look at the, the motion pattern that a foraging bumblebee worker will exhibit, It'll leave its nest, fly more or less along a, a straight flight path. Um, and I'm, I'm being sort of, uh, this is a cartoon picture of what a flight path might look like. And then the bee will stop and forage at a flower patch, and then move along to another flower patch, and along to another flower patch. And so what you'll have is large uh, bouts of largely forward flight, interspersed with um, stopping and maneuvering around in tight spaces. And what we've done quite a bit, and quite well, I think, is to understand the mechanics of and the aerodynamics of um, forward flight. Uh, forward flight for bumblebees has been studied for um, you know, many, many years. Uh, more recently, in the, the lab that I'm a postdoctoral uh, postdoc in, we've been studying how aerial turbulence and how other um, features of the aerial environment affect um, locomotion when these animals are challenged to move largely along straight paths. But what has not been studied um, nearly as much is what happens once they get to these flower patches and have to maneuver through these these crowded aerial environments. Um, when they're confronted with realistic um, cluttered aerial environments that they need to maneuver through to get uh, resources and then move on to the next flower patch. And so this is what I mean by uh, cluttered aerial environment. This is my sort of prototypical uh, flower patch in which you have some light wind. Uh, there are many uh, uh, leaves and stems that these animals have to fly within um, and that they often do fly within. And so we want to ask the questions, how does the patterns of these, these aerial cluttered environments affect things like um, an animal's ability to fly through them, to, um, to maneuver through them? Do we see any specific maneuvering strategies? Um, and do we see any types of collision resistance or collision avoidance that we might expect them to, uh, to uh, exit? And so to this end, we did an experiment over the summer last year in which we challenged uh, uh, bumblebee workers to maneuver through a, an assay, if you will, a maneuverability assay in which they were challenged to maneuver through posts. Uh, we tagged the bumblebee workers uh, so that we knew their identity as they flew through these posts. And then we used high-speed video uh, that was automatically captured as they flew through these environments so that we could collect information about the environmental state um, and collect information about their movement patterns through these environments. So this is sort of a half laboratory experiment, half field experiment, in the sense that all of this is outside. The animals are freely motivated. They're allowed to go out and forage. And so um, their behavioral state is largely determined by, by themselves. We're not scaring them or, or inducing any sort of uh, high-speed locomotion. Um, but at the same time, we get to observe them uh, during the sort of routine flights of their life. The experiment took place uh, at a field station near Harvard. Uh, the foraging area was a forest that's outside of this Concord Field Station uh, building. And we had an arena that looked like this, 15 centimeter tall posts, a meter diameter arena, a half circle arena that they were allowed to fly through. 
and we collected video of them flying through these environments. We did this, like I said, over the, the whole summer. The experiment was automated such that a bee flying through the environment would trigger the cameras to collect that uh, uh, high-speed video from four cameras. We would then analyze the position of the uh, bee within those four videos, and we would know the identity of the bee more or less by a, another camera that was watching the entrance and um, tagging or, or recognizing the barcode tag that was on that bee. And so this is an example of one of those flights. And so again, the question is, if you, if you have these obstacles for the bee to avoid, do we see any differences in their uh, flight patterns as opposed to when there are, are not obstacles in their way? Um, and we're doing this all under the sort of self-motivated behaviors of the bee coming back from foraging or leaving to go foraging, uh, in which it has not been stimulated by us. There's no, there's no um, uh, experimental presence there of, of, the, uh, of, of us. So we take high-speed video, we track the bee flight, um, we reconstruct the 3D uh, kinematics of the, of the individual. We can also extract out the body pose uh, by doing some hull reconstruction, so we can figure out the uh, pitch of the bee, as well as its center of, uh, center of body mass. And we see, not unlike what you would expect, that having posts in the way of the uh, bees flying to their nest entrance slows them down. Of course, this is a sort of obvious, uh, obvious result. But when you have clutter, uh, shown in green here, the flight speed through the environments is slower than when you uh, have these open aerial environments. But I still want to say that this, this flight speed is quite fast. This is around 25, 30 centimeters per second. So this is about 15 body lengths per second that these animals are still capable of flying through these um, cluttered aerial environments. And so now, if we take a look at how um, they're flying through these environments, um, we see that there is a I see now, having stared at it many, many times, uh, that there's a very characteristic maneuver uh, that seems to occur. Bees are confronted with a near head-on collision, uh, which is occurring right here and also here, and they sidestep laterally, maneuver around, and then sidestep back um, as needed. And I'll slow this down. So this is slowed down 10 times now. The bee is again flying at 23 centimeters per second, around 15 body lengths per second. Um, this maneuver here takes around 300 milliseconds, and it's largely dominated by a lateral maneuver uh, in which the bee is facing the direction that it was facing prior to the collision and side steps around. We can see another instance of this uh, here. And so we can quantify these uh, behaviors, and this is work that is currently being done with Severio and, uh, and Dario, in which we can extract out all of these near collisions um, and look for features of uh, movement that may be stereotypical, that may be a prototypical collision avoidance maneuver. Um, I'm not going to say there is one, but I'm going to say that there are striking features of the way that these animals move um, that look like they are sort of conserved behavioral programs. Uh, and in particular, uh, I already sort of led with it in showing you that video, when you, when you quantify the movement pattern of the animals through these environments, so I'm showing you all of these um, something like 1,500 different uh, lateral maneuvers in which a track is, is from an individual bout, which would be almost hit the post in the center here. All of the flights have been centered on that post. They've all been turned into right turns. Um, what you can see is that there's roughly a characteristic distance that they sidestep and move forward. And the way that they do this um, can be seen over on the right hand here, which is the, the sort of average profile of um, different flight metrics for all of these, all of these different trajectories. And the most important thing to see, I'll point you to it, is this plot right here. What this means is, you can see this little diagram, um, maybe a little small, but it's effectively a bumblebee worker, and it's showing a green arrow pointing along the body axis, and a red arrow pointing orthogonal to the body axis. And the green and red represent the, um, the component of the velocity vector that is along the body axis or orthogonal to the body axis. What you see is that far away from a post or prior to collision, most of the uh, forward motion is directed along the body axis, so sort of flying forward, um, which makes sense. But when they're confronted with this, um, this collision criteria, uh, effectively a criteria which was arbitrarily chosen, chosen but which reflects the um, danger of running into an obstacle, how close it is to you, as well as how um, directed your motion is towards it, what you see is that that, uh, that motion is adjusted such that now you start to sidestep and all of your, your forward velocity is now turned into orthogonal sort of lateral velocity. 
and yaw is maintained down here throughout the whole process. So again, it's just like I showed you uh, in that single video, a prototypical maneuver to avoid a collision is to basically move forward towards the object, sidestep around it, and then move forward again. Um, and this happens, again, like I said, pretty quickly, around 200 milliseconds, you know, plus or minus um, a pretty wide margin here. Uh, but that's about 35 wing beats total to go from two centimeters before to two centimeters um, after. And so we think that this is a pretty interesting and exciting um, maneuver strategy, uh, which may have some, some, certainly has some, reflects some mechanical basis of why you might maneuver like this. And this is just an example of how by rolling along the long axis of the body that you can engage uh, orthogonal off axis uh, uh, force vector and maneuver laterally while maintaining body pitch. Um, but the other thing to potentially pay attention to is the, the stability of the head during this whole process. So there, there may be some aspect of vision that's also very important during this process, and that's something that we're, we're in the process of looking at. Um, but the end result of this is that we, we, by doing an experiment like this where we place some, some challenging environment in the path of a central place forager and ask them to go out and you know, forage along their, their daily lives, we get, to, we get to observe their typical behaviors as they move through these um, naturalistic environments. And what we see is that potentially there's stereotype movement patterns that may be um, been utilized to avoid collisions. And so um, with that, I'll wrap up the, the section of this talk which relates to bees because this is still very much ongoing work. But I think that um, this is just an example of how the type of high through, throughput um, mechanisms or, or methods that are being employed in biology at the cellular and multicellular scale can be applied um, to large-scale organisms moving in realistic environments. Um, and bees, I think, are a very good example of, of um, this, you know, applying this technique towards studying locomotion through realistic environments. Um, and hopefully we'll report back on you know, what we see from this uh, soon. But so now I want to transition a little bit. Um, and this is now to the world of ants, uh, where this was the basis of my PhD work. Uh, I studied this ant here. This is the fire ant, Solenopsis invicta. Um, like Dario said, I was in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and Atlanta, Georgia is right about here. Fire ants are an invasive species to the United States. Uh, they came, I think it's something like in the 1920s or 1930s, down to Louisiana or Arkansas. They've since, whoops. They've since spread to, to um, have invaded most of the southern United States. They're an incredibly successful invasive species. Um, they live in large colonies. They're capable of digging in all sorts of um, types of soils. This color, uh, the color here designates a different soil type, for instance. This is just an example of finding fire ants in the sandy soils of Florida, the clay soils of Atlanta, etc. And they live in large colonies. So if you, if you lived in Georgia, and you had a yard, you would typically see one of these mounds in that yard. If you took a shovel and you dug into that, you would typically see hundreds of thousands of ants come streaming out of that. Uh, and I didn't take this video, but I did this many times as part of my PhD work to go out and collect these ants. Uh, it's very fun. Yeah. And so the nest of a fire ant looks like this. Below the surface, um, up to several meters deep, they have these vertical tunnels uh, with chambers within those, uh, interconnecting those tunnels. And uh, throughout the, uh, the, the day or throughout the year, they'll move vertically to adjust or thermoregulate, um, adjust their temperature. And above the surface, they have these, these very um, sort of spongy-like mounds, which are constructed from depositing soil in these environments um, instead of uh, excavating soil. And if you look laterally away from the tunnel, away from that vertical tunnel, so this is the circle right here would represent that, that vertical set of tunnels that I showed you. Um, the scale bar down here, which is unfortunately hard to see, is 10 meters. And so these are just two examples of plaster casts that have been made uh, of fire ant nests, which extend upwards of 84 meters in, in length in the extreme case here. So, you know, this is, you've got your central tunnel, tunnel um, network, which is maybe a meter or two meters deep, but extending away from it about five centimeters below the surface are these foraging tunnels along which the ants um, forage. And so, there are little openings along the, the tunnel length in which ants can pop up and search for food and then go back down into the safety of the foraging tunnel. Um, so these ants are extreme excavators. They live below the surface most of their lives. Um, yet we understand very little about how they actually construct and maneuver within these environments. And so this led me to ask the question, well, 
who is digging in the collective if you have a group of fire ants, who is doing most of the work. As I showed you a little bit before I kind of teased with, with that image of um, large and small fire ant workers, well, if there's a three to four fold um, difference in body size, may we expect that the larger workers are digging? I mean, that seems like a natural hypothesis that the more, you know, the, the task that requires more strength might be you know, done by the larger workers. Um, how are they manipulating the soil, bringing it to the surface? Do we see any evidence of, um, of traffic jams or are they avoiding traffic jams? And lastly, how are they maneuvering through these environments um, at the level of the individual? And so we address this question of who is digging by separating out groups of large workers from groups of small workers. So basically building our own um, colony, which is largely small, largely um, large, uh, and a, a control group. And what we see is that for the most part, there is no significant difference among the uh, uh, size of nests that these ants create, these subgroups create, except for the control groups created slightly larger, um, significantly larger tunnels, uh, nests, than the group of large ants. Um, but even then, I think this difference is, is uh, somewhat small. And to me, what this says is that you have a group of workers who all have this size variation. The size variation is um, thought to occur for some specific reason, reason because the size variation evolves over time. Younger workers have predominantly small, uh, sorry, younger colonies have predominantly small workers, older colonies have a uh, more mix. But this size variation cannot be accounted for by, um, by digging. It's not a, a function of uh, large workers or the workers who are digging out the soil and who are, are taking care of excavation. So the, the colony itself is robust to losses of large numbers of their population, be it you know, specifically the large workers or the small workers. Um, and instead, having a good mix, a healthy mix of uh, small and large workers seems to be the best in terms of who uh, creates the largest nests. Um, secondly, we looked at how they're digging. So specifically, an individual ant has to manipulate soil. Um, and in this case, this is, this is a simulated soil. It's uh, glass particles. They're 250 microns in diameter, and they've been wetted. Um, putting water in induces the animals to dig. They typically dig after uh, rainfall. And so they, they like to dig in wet uh, soil. So you get in wet soil and they do this. They use their mandibles and their antennae and their forelimbs to doggy paddle out soil, place it below their, their um, thorax, and then make these little piles that they then transport to the surface using their uh, mandibles, carrying their mandibles. One of the, the striking observations from this was that if you, if you watch the antenna, they're basically like seventh and eighth legs. So they use their antenna um, very dexterously. And oftentimes they use their antenna to manipulate patches of soil. So, so it sort of suggests that there may be some um, role of the antenna beyond just these sensory devices that they're using to sample the world. Um, we also looked at how collectives move through these, uh, these underground environments. We did this both in tunnels that they created and also in simulated tunnels in which we challenged them to move through large and small environments to seek out essentially principles of, of traffic control that may be exhibited in these environments. But the focus of the, the rest of the talk that I want to I wanna, um, talk about or focus on is how an individual ant displays rapid locomotion up or down within these tunnels. So this is an ant that's climbing down in real time, moving at over 10 body lengths per second within a tunnel that is about 75% its body length, so about 75% its total mid-limb span, so a very confined environment. And they're moving incredibly fast. And if you slow this down and you look at how they're moving through these environments, well, you can appreciate the complexity of running at 10 body lengths per second through a very confined tunnel, in which each footstep is not necessarily guaranteed. What you see is that there is, for example, one slip in which almost all of the limbs are detached from the wall, but the animal keeps moving, so it displays a sort of um, robustness you might expect of, of locomotion within these confined environments. And this led us to ask the question, um, we see that rapid locomotion within these combined environments is not graceful, it's far from it. Um, that was just one example, but you can watch many videos like I unfortunately did, in which these animals are constantly slipping and falling within these environments. Um, you also have to remember that these experiments are done when they have light, so potentially they're, they're using vision to see where they should be stepping. In, in their natural environment, they don't have the, uh, the um, ability to see, they're subtraining, so basically they're doing this kind of rapid locomotion uh, without the, the use of vision. And so we wanted to ask the question, can 
can control the embedded into the environment. And so what I mean by that is, um, is there some sense of building a, a environment in which you can um, move more effectively by the mere fact that you constructed it suitable to your morphology? Um, and you know, it's sort of a simple question. Um, and I think that it's a, it's a natural one because you can think about the analogy that we typically build staircases that are of a step length appropriate for our morphology. And if they're too high or too low, we feel slightly uncomfortable. And if they're irregular, we trip and fall. And so we think that there may be some evidence that the, the ants are doing a similar thing. They're constructing uh, tunnel morphologies which are conducive to rapid locomotion without necessarily having to know where to put your foot at any one, your feet at any one time. Um, but I'm going to address this now with an experiment. Um, and we think that there might be some principles to constructing these subterranean environments that are conducive to stable and effective locomotion of both the individual and the collective. And they may be that they have to be large enough so that you can use your limbs. Um, they should be small enough such that if you fall, you don't, you don't fall all the way to the, the bottom of the tunnel. Um, and, and if you can do that, then you may be able to maneuver uh, with sort of limited control in these underground environments. So to address this question, we did an experiment. Again, this is much in the, the similar theme of the experiment that I showed you before, where we took colonies of fire ants, we placed a nest, um, a sort of simulated subterranean nest, uh, between a foraging arena, I'm sorry, we placed a nest uh, uh, adjacent to a foraging arena, in which between it were a series of vertical tunnels. These are smooth wall glass tunnels, so they're sort of the most challenging subterranean environment, subterranean confined environment, that these animals um, have to maneuver through. And these tunnels have different diameters, uh, in which the diameters go from, I believe it was one millimeter in diameter, which we never saw an animal go through that, up to nine millimeters in diameter. Um, fire ants are around three and a half millimeters in body weight. Uh, so, and this spans the range of the size of tunnels that you typically see in their natural nest, which can actually be from three to around 14. Um, we then asked the question, how are they moving through these uh, tunnels? Are they choosing specific tunnels, et cetera? Um, we did high-speed observation where an animal would move through the tunnel would trigger a high-speed camera, take um, video, we would then quantify the kinematics of their movement patterns through these environments. Um, and you know, we would get very high fidelity information about what the legs are doing, where the legs are positioned, how fast they're moving, et cetera. What you see is that if you just look at the stride frequency versus um, velocity, uh, this collapse of data, this cloud of, of points here for both vertical climbing, ascending climbing, and descending climbing, um, basically collapse together despite the fact that within here are all of the tunnels um, included in this data set. And the black points here correspond to the original videos that I showed you in which the animals were moving through their, their self-constructed environments. So what we see is basically a typical um, kinematic locomotor pattern in which by moving, moving their, their limbs at a higher frequency they advance forward at a higher speed. Seems to suggest a typical stride length that these animals are um, uh, using when they're moving through these, these uh, confined environments. But what's striking is if you look at the, say, two extremes of moving through a very confined environment and, say, one that has slightly more um, space, they, they tend to use their midlimbs, and this is sort of a subtle point here, their midlimbs um, in different ways. So you can see here that when this animal is moving through an environment that is less than its um, body length in diameter, so it's moving through a very confined environment, the midlimbs tend to be I'll say cramped up like this, sort of pointing, pointing towards their hind uh, limbs. Whereas when they're in these, uh, these larger environments, they tend to prefer to have their midlimbs sprawled out. And if you quantify this by just measuring the midlimb span, you can see that it basically transitions here from something which is about keeping your midlimbs out um, as far as you can reach them, which is this, this limb span here. Um, this occurs when you're in large tunnels. When you're in small tunnels, you adopt this posture where you're, where you're in a pushing posture. And again, like I said, it's a subtle point because you have to think about what are the forces that are being generated at the end? You know, what are the end effective forces here? Well, in this case, the animal is pushing with its midlimbs to generate um, ascending locomotory forces. And in this case, they're pulling. So you've got to switch in the, in the way that they're using their limbs to maneuver through the environments. And that transitions across um, tunnel diameters. So as you go from small to large tunnel diameters, the way you use your limbs differs Yet, as I just showed you, there was no effect of tunnel diameter on their speed through these environments. So they sort of seamlessly transitioned from pushing to pulling, uh, all while moving at the same speed, independent of the size of the tunnel. And the way that they can do this is, is that they have this remarkable um, tarsi and, and spiny hairs along their limbs that 
when you're in small environments, confined environments, all of the spiny hairs along the limbs can be used to basically jam you up against the wall and push. Whereas when you're in a, you know, say a flat surface or you're in a large uh, dam or tunnel, the tarsal hooks and the adhesive pads at the end of the limb can be used to generate tensile forces. Um, and so basically by actuating with the same, say, torque pattern at the, at the shoulder, independent of whether your arms are up like this or down like this, you can generate the same locomotory forces, uh, which we think is pretty novel and a good example of how um, the use of these, these uh, different morphological structures can enable multimodal uh, locomotion. But this is the thing that I got really excited about, um, and I hope you guys will get excited about too. It's a very subtle, again, here, you see that the animal is climbing down fairly fast. Uh, it seems to slip and the body pitches and then it keeps going on um, as if it, you know, it was rapidly arrested. And if I slow this down, what you can see, which I hope you can see, is that if you pay attention to the antennae, the antennae are basically the first points of contact that occur as the animal slips and falls. And I'll show you some better examples of this, but I just want to show you that this happens in these sort of unstimulated um, environments in which it's just forced to run. Here's a more extreme example of that, in which an animal is just climbing down a tunnel, and it falls, and what you see again is that the antennae are the first points of contact as it's falling, and arguably uh, are aiding dramatically in, in the arrest of that fall. Here's another example. Falls, uses the antennae as, a, as effectively seventh and eighth appendages, certainly they're load-bearing, uh, and it arrests its fall by grabbing itself with it and exposing arms. Here's probably the most fun example of this. Um, and so this project consisted of, you know, collecting hundreds of these falls and watching these cute ants fall and, and hit their antennae. But, you know, when you think about it, it's really remarkable that, that you know, I naively think of antennae as these sensory appendages that should be protected, but here the, the ants are putting their antennae out there um, as the sort of first points of contact to arrest their fall, and certainly they are um, bearing loads and, you know, potentially being, being put in, in the way of, um, of getting damaged but they seem to use their antennae as these load-bearing um, appendages to arrest falls. This is just one more example of, if you measure the antennae um, span as a function of time, and you look at that with respect to the vertical distance of the ant, you see that when it starts to fall, the antennae goes from sort of uh, sensing the environment to being spread out, either through inertial forces or through some sort of um, feedback process we don't know, um, but spread out until it makes contact with the walls at which point the fall is arrested um, through both antennae and limb contact and everything uh, <laughs> contacting the wall. And then the ant can move, uh, move along. So this is probably the most fun experiment because we then wanted to ask the question, well, how does the size of a tunnel and how does the, the animal's morphology contribute to stability in these environments? So what we did was we had to perturb them to see how they would respond to being knocked from a wall and, and challenged with uh, uh, catching themselves. So this whole experiment was mounted to an air piston in which when an ant um, crossed the top region here, we would fire the air piston downwards um, at around 20 AG, so knocking them from the wall. And we could then ask the question, how does the size of a tunnel and how does the, the use of antennae and limbs um, influence the stability that you may see within these confined environments? So this is an example of this experiment in real time. Um, air piston is being fired, ants are being basically rocketed to the, to the bottom of the tunnels. Um, this is not at all what we expect they're, they're experiencing within their underground environments. This is a, an extreme, extreme case, merely to see how does tunnel influence, how does tunnel size influence um, stability and, and um, perturbation uh, resistance within underground environments. Um, so here's an example of this slowed down uh, 40 times. So again, a very extreme perturbation. Um, the ants are basically dislodged from the wall and then they catch themselves. One of the remarkable things of this is that only around 50% of the time were ants dislodged from the wall. Most of the time they were able to adhere throughout this whole process. So I think it's a testament to their ability to stick to even smooth surfaces like this with their adhesive pads or with their tarsi or with, um, with frictional mechanisms. Um, but we see that in, during these perturbations, their falls are arrested using limbs and antennae and, and basically everything. And so we can now, we're in a position to assess how well um, uh, geometry, the geometry of the environment, affects uh, the ability to resist falling. So this is a plot here showing diameter normalized by body length. Apologies if you can't see that. Um, and this is the probability to resist a fall, a probability to, to catch yourself. Um, and you can see that it goes from 100% when you're in very small tunnels 
to 0% when your enlarged tunnels, as you may expect. And we have this transition here. And this transition is what's interesting because if you look at the size of tunnels that this transition occurs in, well, basically, much like you'd expect, this transition occurs right around the, um, the size of the tunnel, which you can no longer span the width. You can no longer use your antennae to vault you to the opposing wall. You can no longer reach across the tunnel to catch yourself. Um, and so in tunnels larger than that, you basically fall to the bottom. And smaller than that, you're able to resist falling. So that we think that this may be very useful if you're effectively blind, running at high speed within an underground environment, to build tunnels that are right around the size such that you can use, um, use control surfaces that have been embedded in the environment um, to maneuver at high speed. So this brings us to our last question, which is, OK, so we've seen that in these glass tunnels doing this experiment, we can knock them from the walls and they catch themselves in this size tunnel. What size tunnels do they um, excavate when given the opportunity to excavate tunnels in nature? Um, so to do this, uh, I was in a lab in which we studied locomotion through granular media. So we had the ability to use x-ray machines for our research. We had, we had two or three different x-ray machines. So we built a homemade CT scan. Largely all you need for uh, doing CT reconstruction is an x-ray source, an x-ray detector, and some uh, device which you can rotate the object of interest in between. So you put a, um, you put a bu bunch of ants in a, a large tube, you allow them to dig for a couple days, and then you put that tube in front of the x-ray source and detector, rotate it, and then there's some nice open source um, CT reconstruction software out, out there that you can use to reconstruct the size of tunnels that they create in these unbounded you know, three-dimensional environments. And so what you see is that you can identify the tunnels in these 3D reconstructions. This is a, a cross-section here um, of uh, several tunnels that these ants created. And this is just an example of the um, typical cross-sections that we see uh, of a vertical tunnel uh, created in three-dimensional environments. I should say, um, I'm not showing you the data, but we did this in uh, a variety of different types of soil, um, both wet and dry, ranging from 50 micron diameter sort of more powdery soil up to um, larger, if I remember correctly, 600 micron diameter um, large-scale boulders. Um, and what we found that was that the size of the tunnels was unaffected by soil type, the cross-sectional area. So if they're challenged to move through very fine-scale soils or uh, constructed fine-scale soils or in larger soils, they create tunnels which are just about the size. And if you uh, look in the literature, what you see is that the size is um, pretty much right around what you see from excavations that have been done by biologists, where the vertical nest entranceways are around three to four millimeters in diameter. Um, incipient nest tunnels, meaning that the, the first nest tunnels that are constructed by uh, queens are around uh, three millimeters in diameter. And then the vertical tunnels deeper in the nest and also the horizontal tunnels that I talked about are, are substantially bigger, um, which may have uh, traffic implications. We also saw similar tunnel diameters in our 2D experiments as well. And if you look at this, how this relates to the size of, of ants, well, you see that the, the favorite tunnel diameter to construct is right around the body length of an individual. And if you remember from my previous um, previous sort of demonstration of where these ants are most stable, what you see is that this transition point right here uh, in the stability of ants' uh, uh, locomotor capacity in these confined environments is matched very well with the size of the environments that they create, um, which is a sort of correlative observation that they create environments which are conducive to them not slipping and falling and being very stable. And also, it's right around the, the transition between um, their sort of favored uh, uh, sprawled midland stance when they're in open environments, and they're in more confined stance when they're in enclosed environments. So what we think is that this is, you know, if I want to think about this at a very high level, it's sort of like, again, building, building um, some subterranean environment which is conducive to your morphology. So the ant that built your tunnel six months ago sort of set it up for you today to be able to move through stably because it's of a suitable size and, and you know, um, related to your morphology, it's, it's suitable for you to move through rapidly. So in the end, we see that um, stable locomotion is effectively afforded by the environment that you construct in these, um, in these underground tunnels. And that tunnel size affects posture. We see transitions in the way that they use the midlings. We see a very interesting uh, way in which they use their antennae, which has been unreported, that uh, the antennae can serve as effectively locomotory appendages that can uh, bear weight. And this basically brings me to the conclusion of all of this, which is that I think by doing these um, experiments with the ants, you see very interesting um, uh, behaviors that come from looking at locomotion in, in naturalistic environments. You see that appendages are used in many different ways, um, some unexpected. 
you see that when you when you uh, perturb individuals or groups, um, that oftentimes they're they're resistant to these perturbations in interesting ways. Sometimes they aren't. Um, and this this last example, I don't know what to call it, an innate controller, morphological computation of the cleft. It doesn't sound right, but you know somehow embedding control into the environment through construction and through innate behaviors that the animals may have um, allows for uh, stable locomotion for the collective rather than just the individual. So this basically also brings me to the conclusions of this talk, which are that uh, I think social insects are incredibly fascinating. Um, they, they have myriad biological questions still associated with them, but they're also incredibly useful for understanding locomotion and the types of behaviors that we observe in natural systems. Um, and in particular, to, to, to sort of use them, to leverage them as um, test bits for studying locomotion, we need to develop tools to capture these behaviors, um, observe them, quantify them, and then you know, understand the sort of scope or dimensionality of the different types of locomotory behaviors that they exhibit in um, culture. Um, and you know, I think that, again, like I said before, there's fertile ground for collaborations among uh, engineers and roboticists and, and biologists um, to address some of these questions now that we have um, very powerful tools to, to capture and quantify um, the types of locomotion that we see. Um, I think with that I'll say thanks to my advisor. So uh, Dan Goldman and Mike Goodisman advised me for most of my PhD work uh, on ants, and I'm currently advised by Rob Wood and Stacy Combs. And I guess with that I can say thank you. And thank you. So, you have shown that, if I understand correctly, the ants excavate tunnels which are tuned to their size. So there is this, uh, they go to the edge of the critical transition where they would fall. But at the same time, you have shown in one slide that uh, these fire ants have um, a size that range from one to three. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering that, uh, how, how does this fit there? So I would expect tunnels which have huge variability. Yeah, no, it's a great question, um, and that's a good and, and, and do they select, if they have huge variability, do they select the time they go with the trap and things? So that, um, we, I'll say, actually, I don't think we saw preference for large ants moving through smaller large tunnels. What, what is surprising, though, um, it's a very good point, is that you know, when we did these experiments challenging large and small ants to move, I'm oh, sorry, to construct environments, uh, what I'm not showing you here you know, I'm showing you basically the final nest size, but um, within this paper, we also looked at the size of tunnels that they created. And it was independent of, of the size of animals that were creating. So the large ants created tunnels which were much too small for them, if I'll say it that way, whereas the small ants created tunnels which were appropriate for themselves. So, so the large ants are still capable of maneuvering through these environments and not falling because they're just in a tunnel that's on the smaller side of what they would construct if they were just constructing it for them for themselves, for the sort of locomotory uh, uh, hypothesis. So does that make sense? And I can show you, you can see another example of this sort of again. Um, so here, there's going to be a large worker ant within there that's going to come down. Um, this is a very typical size tunnel that these ants create, these vertical entrance tunnels. Um, and there could be several other reasons that they're of this size. It could be um, defense as well. These are typically the nest entrance ways, and so maybe it's for keeping out larger ants as well. You know, the experiment that we did is, I, I think it's, it's an observation that, that what we see is that they create these size tunnels, and there could be a number of reasons that they do it. I'm not saying it's explicitly to move, you know, stably, but they certainly move through their, their environments that they construct um, and benefit from this sort of stability. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question why large and small ants within this, this population create tunnels of the same size, and why it would seemingly be, it would hinder large ants to create tunnels that are too small for them. Because then you get into situations, which I can show you, two large ants meeting in a tunnel like this, one of them has to back up. So it's a good question. I don't, I don't, I don't know why. Um, but they certainly create the same size tunnel. Uh, so in your bee example, you show that the bees essentially run into an obstacle, well, come very close to running into an obstacle before going into an evasive maneuver. Do you have any idea why they get so close to the obstacle before trying to avoid it? Or is that kind of unknown at this point? It uh, doesn't seem like a... Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, I think that, you know, honestly, some of that may be unknown and maybe Severio um, can 
from some of his work is, is figuring that out. I think that, I think that there's some um, idea that they, they it may be only within a span of 10 centimeters that they actually pick up the post, they see the post. Um, but also, you know, these tend to, tend to fixate on objects to maneuver around them. So it may be that you need to get close enough to figure out how big it is to then figure out how you can maneuver around it. But, you know, much of that work is still, I would say, I don't know the answer to it. I'm, you know, I'm sort of excited to, to talk about the bits of it that I do know, but there's a lot of still open questions about that. Specifically, why do they stop where they stop? And the, the counter to that, too, is that a lot of times they do run into the post. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm sort of cherry picking out the instances in which they maneuvered around it, but there's a lot of evidence that they they are running into posts, they're running into ceilings, things like that. Do they never run into the amount of velocity at which they injure themselves? Sorry, say that again? Do they ever injure themselves when they run into I, I mean, I don't know if they ever injure themselves. There's certainly evidence that uh, that bees' wings wear down over time. Um, so older older workers have these sort of tattered wings. But it's not, sh not clear if that's coming from specific aerial collisions or just when they're flying in to land on a flower, they're hitting um, the parts of the flower that are next to them. Other questions? Then I have one. So how do the, do, what do we know about the sense of information the ants use when they excavate these tunnels? Is it like visual ants? Is it you know, antennas? Or I, I mean, I think that... Uh, receptors on the legs? I, I think that Little, yeah. Um, I think that the antennae are certainly very sensitive chemoreceptors, tactile um, sensors. They they typically probe around um, and look for little divots in the soil. So that's what we've observed, that you can see that they're basically feeling around um, for, I would say, loose bits of soil or for regions in, of the, the tunnel face where they can excavate. But at, at some level, some of that's just based off of our long-term observation of it. I, I don't, whether they're using vision, certainly don't know. So, but you say when when they excavate down in the tunnel, probably there is no light. Yes. Okay. So, could we even uh, assume that it's like an open loop process, meaning they don't use any sensor information? Yeah. So their morphology is such that they keep excavating. And their morphology defines what the tunnel size is. Yeah, I mean, so the the concept of stig merging is effectively this that that through through alteration of the environment, there is a feedback process that's going on in which you, your behavioral program is maybe to say, um, a divot of a certain size in a tunnel, I'm gonna start digging there. And by another ant creating that divot, then you sort of feedback upon that, start digging there. And so the, the structure emerges from these individual interactions of an individual altering, altering the environment and another individual doing some, some sensing of how that has been altered and then basing its next decision based on that. And then also, um, fire ants um, use pheromones heavily too, so there could be some chemical communication that's going on here. It could be scenting, saying, you know, active tunnel phase here, active tunnel phase here. But an interesting um, problem that emerges when you're trying to, say, say you're a fire ant colony, and you've been um, flooded from your nest because these animals originate in the floodplains of Argentina and Brazil. Okay, so routinely through the summer, they're flooded from the nest. They actually have a behavior in which they all link their arms together and they float out the flood and then they're now deposited on fresh soil. It's, it's an imperative to get into the soil quickly. But that act of, say, every worker trying to dig out a tunnel is sort of, um, it works against yourself because now the tunnel is very crowded, right? So I think that there is a combination of um, sensing the local environment, sensing, um, sensing what the morphology of the tunnel structure is, as well as what is the sort of crowding condition of that tunnel that dictates whether you should start tunneling over here, over here, or whatever. And in termites, it's well known that when you have these lines of termites forming to get to the tunnel face, they start branching. So branching can just be a process that emerges from overcrowding within a tunnel. That's have you investigated uh, the surface of these antennas? Do they have any sort of additional hooks or something that you know when it falls, it you know, additionally uh, uh, attaches to the to the soil. That's a great question. Um, no, I haven't. <laughs> no, but I think uh, I think we should. I mean, I think that uh, I don't. I'm fascinated by their antennae because I think that there's certainly very little evidence beyond what we just showed of them using their antennae for anything beyond sensory roles. But even then, in, in terms of uh, how they're using their their antennae to sort of shape the environment that they live in, I think is is something that's a bit of an open question. So, no, I haven't done that, but I, I think that somebody should. 
any questions? It's more or less the same question about the ants. I don't know if you have some, some idea how they navigate the bees. Yeah. Now, where, 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 where they're getting very close to polar rocks, like how. So, do they use them like regionally or do they use another means of navigation? Um, below the surface of them? You're talking about in the. In no, the not ants, I'm talking about the bees. Oh, the bees, okay. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, and, and I, I know. And less about how what it, what explicitly they're using from all the different sensors that they have on them um, to to do these lateral sachets. So I um, I think my hypothesis is that they're actively using vision during this process. But these are experiments that we're planning on doing designing right now. So so I don't have a good answer to that question. Okay. Any other questions? In the case that thank Nick again.